Hi, my name is Christine Walker and I am the leader of the Kano Walker Wirritchen Pegrelin project. And I would like to introduce you to one of Kano's oldest friends and mentors in martial arts, George Pacayas. All right, here we go. I'm here today uh, with um, a good friend of uh, Uncle Kano's, George. Caius. Caius. Pacayas. Pacayas. And with Aunty Christine Walker, um, Kano's wife. And um, we're just uh, here to ask a few questions uh, with George um, about um, some of the experiences he had with Kano. And I have a, a few questions for him. Um, the first question I have for you, George, is um, what experience did you get from knowing Kano? Uh, knowing Kano was a very broad experience because there was the understanding of what he was trying to achieve as a human being and that was amazing. He was a forthright man who had a dream about supporting and helping his community and it was something that a lot of us guys that knew him and, and loved him got involved in and became a bit of a passion for a long time. He was a genuine man who was trying to do more for his people than I've seen anybody do for anybody. Yeah, that, that, that sort of passion and that sort of commitment to what he believed was right helped me become a greater man, I think, gave me a clearer understanding of, of what the community was about, what the people were about, and for the, for the weaknesses and the strengths within that community, I got to see the best of it. I got to see the strength of the community. I got to understand that there was a depth of knowledge and depth of understanding that uh, most of us non-Indigenous people just didn't understand. Uh, it was a lesson about life. Knowing Kano was about a lesson about life because I'd always had Indigenous friends because I understood racism very well and I understood what it meant and I dealt with it a lot as a child. So I had an open, open attitude towards people. But Kano really made me understand what the Indigenous community was about in its true form and its true sense. Not in, in, the, in the scatteredness of it at times and that wasn't the community's fault but in its depth and it gave me a respect and, a, and an understanding of a community that was completely amazing. Um, and Kana was the forthright aspect of it because his talent was phenomenal. He had talent in every aspect of his life. But all human beings have something special about them. But Kana had a lot of things special about him. He was not just a strong man and a forthright honorable man that loved his community, but he was an artist. He was a musician, he was a bit of a poet, he was a comedian, and his, he was always driven to doing greater things. Even watching him walk up to a young black fellow who's got a hoodie on and his head down and he's walking down the street with his hands in his pockets, looking and feeling miserable. Kana, I've watched him walk up to young men like that and have a five, not even a five minute chat with them. And all of a sudden, their hoodies off, their heads high, and they're walking proud with their chest down, their hands no longer in their pockets. Then they're opening themselves up immediately to a sense of pride, a sense of dignity. And he could do that for any young man. If that young man was willing to stand and listen. So it, I think it brought me forward as a human being, but it also told me that everybody is somebody. If they're getting the opportunity to be something, and that's where Kana was at all the time. He never saw weaknesses in people, he saw strength in them. He saw the greatness in those that were suffering. And for many people that I saw, I witnessed, he brought them forward. And that was something that I think I've lived with, because I now say for myself, I'm a teacher, but my teaching is about bringing people forward. That was a lesson I think I learned from Kana when I was just a 20 year old boy. You know? And it started there and grew over the years. All right, so uh, I've got another question for you, George. Um, why were you so close to Kano? All right, that's a pretty easy question to answer. Um, I met Kano, I was around 20, he was around 22 years old. He walked into my karate club, it was my first club. I was just a young instructor, I might have been teaching six months at the time. And um, I looked up, I was in the middle of the room, the class had to start, I was chatting with a couple of students. Kano walked into the dojo and I looked across and I saw this skinny fellow standing there and then he smiled at me and the smile was the biggest smile I've ever seen in my life. 
it forced me to cross the room and immediately go and talk to him. And that conversation was short. It was, I'm interested in martial arts. I says, have you done any before? He says, not really. And I went, okay, well then maybe you should give it a go tonight. Join us for a couple of free lessons, see how you feel. And he said, I'd like to do that, brother. Those word, that word brother has stuck with me for life. Um, at that moment, he started to train me for a couple of weeks and I'm coming back to him going, I've sparred you, you've learned some stuff. He goes, not really, he had that humility about him, which was very easy to respect. I, no, I've done a little bit here, but I don't really know anything. He really knew a lot. Um, he really knew a lot. And at the end of that two week period, he said, brother, I want to show you something. I went, okay. And we walked down to the Festival Theatre where there was a giant sized painting of him up on the Festival Theatre wall with his grandmother on a cloud above him. And he told me the story and what it meant. When he first said, that's me, brother, I went, really? And I looked at him and I looked back up at the air and I went, yeah, it actually looks like you. He goes, no, that's me, brother, with my bass guitar. And, and that's my grandmother on the cloud. She was a queen. And I went, okay. And that makes you, he says, that makes me king. And I went, that's amazing. Um, considering you don't have any shoes, which was like a, a joke. We used to joke a lot, even by then we were already stirring each other. But at that point I thought to myself, that must mean something to this man for him to drag me down. He'd go for a nice long walk with my clubbers at North Adelaide and walk down the festival theater, we chatted the whole time. At that moment, I suddenly realized I must mean something to this man. At that point, he already meant something to me because I am a lover of my students. But it came more than that. Um, the friendship was legitimate. His heart was open. His goal was to better himself. And we soon seemed to understand each other clearly. And our sense of humor is matched. And he was as forthright as I was when it came to racism. He understood the hardship of it. He understood the tragedy behind it. But he also understood that's not where we should live. Which is what I always believed from a young man. I fought for the right to be Australian because I came from a European family that were new Australians. And we got given a hard time because we were wogs and we didn't belong here. Go home wog. From people that really didn't belong here anyway. And so we had that connection between us because I think we understood who we were as human beings. And growing to love Kano wasn't difficult because that smile just took you apart. It touched my heart the first time I saw the smile and he kept that with me all the time. So as far as why I was connected to Kano, he was a beautiful man. He was an honest, beautiful, dignified man that had self-respect and that cared about others and showed that we're all equal, even though we come from different parts of the world, we're all equal, we're all human beings, we all love, we all hate, we all suffer, and we all, and we all dance. And I think that completes a picture of why I was in love with the man and I was in love with the man from a young man and always did what he asked of me. Especially when he needed me, being there for him was my greatest honour. I was saying yes to things without even asking what I was saying yes to. But I always had this feeling in my heart that whatever Kano asked of me, it'd be righteous. It'd be fair and it'd be reasonable. And it always was. Okay, George, um, thank you very much for that. Um, what you... What were your impressions about Kano's knowledge about culture? Okay, my impression, and it's an impression that stems for a lifetime, since we were young men, he was one of the wisest men I'd ever met. And um, I've learned more, I understood more about yeah, the indigenous culture, just simply because he understood it. And he had a knowledge, a wealth of knowledge and understanding of exactly what it was about. Um, I don't think there's, I haven't met too many people that really understood the traditional culture and I think that stemmed from his education as a young lad. He, he developed the right education and, and he was always had a thirst for knowledge. Because he had a thirst for knowledge, I think he chased his cultural background, he chased his understand, the understanding of where people came from. He spoke to many elders and he got the education he required and I think he did that himself. I don't think he was sat down from day one and told everything. What I gathered with Kane, he sat down with many elders from many different places, just simply to get an understanding of where where his culture came from, what his culture was about, and his wealth of knowledge was quite incredible. 
for a man that uh, when I met him, he told me he was dyslexic and had difficulty filling out his membership forms. He was the smartest man I'd ever met. Mm. He had ability to remember everything. He had the ability to, to record in his mind what most people can record through reading, he recorded through listening and through wanting, wanting the, the knowledge. And I think for him, knowledge was a passion. Because the longer I knew him, the wiser he became, the smarter a man he was. Yeah, it got to a stage where I was thinking to myself, I'm not going forward because look at this guy. And he was always able to do that. He always had something new to tell me, something new about his culture, something he'd discovered, something he experienced. I think his cultural understanding came from the hard work he put into one life of knowing who he was and wanting to prove it. And that wasn't about riches or fame or fortune. It was just about him wanting to be identified for who he was. He never wanted to take anything from anybody. He wanted to give. And I believe that was also part of the culture. Giving was part of the culture that, that um, the indigenous people have. Sometimes that line gets blurred in today's society. But I think in the foundations of the indigenous community it was always about giving, giving to others. And um, not that's only what that, he did. Not only that, the Ramanjuri people are well known for their law enforcement and their peacekeeping. That's part of them. And so along with all that, George and a whole group of the, the martial artists helped form the Aboriginal security, SA Aboriginal security team. So a lot of the actual functions that were actual for the indigenous, like the football carnivals and all the rest of that, yeah, we, we did, did that. Yeah. We did all that, and we've got a lot of stories about them, haven't oh, we? Those we've got times? some wild stories, but, but you know, we kept the peace. And the amazing thing was, I went with Carno for seven or eight years in security. I never got a scratch in the black community. No. The most beautiful community I've ever been in, because I've worked all the clubs around Adelaide. I've worked some pretty tough places, and a lot of them full of wogs like me. And we use that term with, with endearment nowadays. We believe we are wogs and we love that about ourselves. We're proud of that. But I got more busted up, lost more, more broken teeth, more black eyes, and lost more shirts in that, working in the general community. Yet, I never had to wash blood off of one of my yellow shirts. No. I never, there was never violent. It was, there was always a level of respect there and I think that came from the fact that Kano was an understood man by his community and a loved man. And so we were all loved because not all of us were indigenous. Most of us weren't. But we were respected like we were brothers and sisters of the community because we were standing behind an amazing man who fought for the right to be a security agent. He fought for the right to be a respected man, but he did it with dignity. Uh, even at the beginning when he, when he contacted me to join him, he rang me up at work and went, brother, I need a favor. I said, whatever you want, brother, it's yours. Yes. He goes, yeah, I haven't told you yet. I says, I'm going to say yes anyway. Then he said, I want you to work with me on the security team. I went to Supreme Court to get a B-grade license. During the days when, when bouncers were being converted to agents and had to get licenses, he says, but I need an A-grade license here to supervise me currently. So I said, so you're going to employ me to be your supervisor? He goes, yes. Well, that works for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we went off to work together. We did our first show together at the Lions Centre, 2,000 people. And I thought, well, how are we going to handle this? 2,000 people, it's just two of us. But no, the dignity in that community and the respect for that man meant that it was a walk in the park all night. At the end, of, when I got there, I, I crapped myself a little bit. I thought, oh my God, how are we going to handle this? <laughs> I was used to that big a crowd with only two people. Yeah. There was 2,000 people there. You just don't do that with the security team. It was just, but it was a beautiful night. After that, I thought, okay, I got no apprehensions about this. This is going to be fantastic. And then the fringe came along and we built a team. And we built it through all the guys that loved him because the guys that trained on that team were all out of my club. They're all guys he trained with. They knew him well. He was one of their, one of their warrior brothers. So when I put the word out and said to my boys, Kano needs our help, I'm working with him, but he needs help. All the guys that were licensed put their hands up and says, we well, can't work with him, no problem. And we created a team and we did some really good work. And the only reason that happened was because once again, this man wasn't just in his own community. He was just generally loved. Um, and his cultural awareness, well, that was exceptional. There's only very few people in this country that are indigenous that really understood what he understood.
and the language that he was helping me develop. Yeah, he had a magic about him. He did have a magic about him. And then George said to me that I should be getting my security license. I said, no, 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 no. Anyway, yeah, yeah, he, talked yeah. me, <laughs> he talked me into getting my license, so and the that's Carter how I made become him, a part of it. The Carter made him my partner. <laughs> I says, how come I'm working with Christine, can't I? He says, she's my woman. He goes, I can't focus if my woman's next to me. He says, but I know, brother, you can and you'll look after her. Yeah, brother, I'll look after her. I had to chase her a lot. Where you going? Don't go in there, Christine. There's like 60 guys in there fighting and she's in the middle. And I've got to run in with her. But you know what? Never, got, never got a scratch. Touched. Never got a scratch. And we made a great team. We did, we made a great team. We did. Okay, um, George, Christine said she's had quite a few experiences with Kano where she's seen him do some magics. Like, have you had any experiences with magic with Kano as well? Oh yeah, I have. Oh yeah, it was an experience and a half. It, it widened my eyes a lot. I was working for Croydon College of TAFE in a paint store and I just separated recently and uh, I was going through some things and I needed to talk to him because he always made me feel right. And I picked the phone up and rang his place and got no answer. So I hung the phone up and standing at my counter of my store, the phone's right next to me. And I'm going, brother, where are you? I really need to talk to you. And then the phone rings. And it's kind of at the other end of the line. I pick up the phone and I says, he says, hello, brother, what did you need? And I went, where are you? He says, I'm on Kangaroo Island. I says, how did you know that I needed to talk to you, brother? He says, little bird told me. Now, it wasn't a coincidence. Not like Kano rang me very often. He rang me when he wanted me to work with him on security, and that was the only other time he ever rang me at work. But the words he said to me were, brother, what you want, what can I do for you? And the response was, a bird told me. Now, if that's not magic, I don't know what is, because there was no way in the world, from Kangaroo Island, could he, me, he, could he hear my call? And, that was something that made me really wise. I can tell you the first time I ever met George, I'd been with Kano a couple of weeks, and he also was taking me for a walk down to that mural to have a look at the, at the festival theatre of him. That was the chasm, that was a chasm um, centre of Aboriginal Studies and Music mural where he's on there playing his bass guitar. And um, next minute he stops in the middle of Rundle Mall and he said, oh, Hang on a minute. And he could feel George. And next minute, he comes flying, running, and you know those great big pavilions they got in Rundle Mall? Bounces off that straight onto Kano like a little monkey. <laughs> she got back to head feet, she didn't know what was going on. <laughs> I thought, what in the hell? And Kano, Kano knew. And I've seen him do that with a lot of other, not a lot of others, there's a couple of others that he was really close to. I saw him, he knew when they were around. Without seeing us, because without just the feeling, like because I we, wasn't, I came from the other end of the mall, yeah, and I don't believe I'd entered the mall yet when he had said George is here, and when I saw him, I was amazed that he was there. Yep. And it wasn't long before that I was talking to the girl I was dating at the time uh, about him, and then I walked in the window. There he was. I got so excited, I get a bit excited. I stuck my fist in the air. I yelled out, "Kano!" Monkey and I magic. ran straight at him. <laughs> I must have done about three feet through the air, but I knew Kano would catch me. I knew Kano would catch me. I'm I did. I let myself me. go. I literally flew through the air, hit this pylon, got airborne, and flew a good three or four meters in the air. And I knew he was going to catch me. And he just caught me and spun around and put me down. And then Christine went, because oh, she realised <laughs> she realised that we were actually friends, and I wasn't running at him to attack him. I was just a bit overjoyed to see him at that moment. We hadn't worked for a couple of weeks yeah. because I was there when Kano saw Christine and I'm, that's a story I want to tell too very quickly um, go take as long as you want we were standing side by side at the door me and Kano and at the Hilton Hotel at the Hilton Hotel <laughs> at the uh, mile in there yeah. and I I always knew when Kano was in thought you could see him switch into thought so I looked at him and went what you doing Kano and he looked at me and says, you see that woman over there? I said, which one? There's a few of them sitting against it. One with the blue and green dress on. Like, yeah, that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. What about her? He goes, I'm going to marry her. I went, oh, okay. Do you know her? He goes, no. <laughs> Have you spoken to her? He goes, no, brother. 
but you're going to marry her. He goes, yeah, brother. I went, okay. Two weeks later, there he is walking down a mall with her. <laughs> I got a bit excited because the whole thing blew my mind again. It blew my mind a lot like that because he meant it. He meant it when he saw her, that he was going to marry that woman. And two weeks later, he's with her. And I didn't doubt him. Kind of never said anything he didn't mean. He wasn't a man you could doubt, even though it was the most far-fetched thing a man could say to a mate. It's a very far-fetched thing you can say. See that woman over there? I'm going to marry her. Do you know her? No. Have you spoken to her? No. But you're going to marry her? Yes. Okay. No other man could have said that to me and I would have believed him. I would have said, you're an idiot. Well, but can't I? I had that depth of faith in him. I believed him immediately. And I was quite excited that day. And he married you. Yeah. Back of me. Eight years later, but... Hey, you guys are serious <laughs> mad, all right? <laughs> well, the thing is, I walked up to the bar and because I was the driver, designated driver, I ordered a lemon squash and he came up and said hello. And I went, yeah, hi, and just kept walking. Because I didn't know him, so I wasn't, I wasn't even looking. So it's like a pizza delivery, you know, you don't have to go outside sometimes, it just gets delivered to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yes, that's what happened. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the magic. Okay, what were some of the uh, other experiences you had with doing security with Carno? Well, as a, we've had a lot of experiences, we've got a lot, I've got a lot of stories, but I think starting at the beginning is probably a good place. And it demonstrates who Carno was as a human being and the forthrightness he had and the thought he had behind what he was doing. We started working and we brought in some of my guys to help out from the club. We're all family, we're all mates. And it's a little bit before Christine came along only just before Christine came along and joined the team because once she took, once she joined the team uh, the whole business ran a lot more smoothly because she had a very good sense about how things should operate but that day I was we were working together me and Kano and I says so how are you working this Kano this uh, the business as, as it's working how are you working and what are you charging and um, he says to me well I'm charging what I'm paying you guys I says so back then it was years ago, we were doing about 17 50 an hour, which was a reasonable rate for security work. And we weren't there for the money, we were there to support Kano, so we weren't asking for more than what, than what the average was, we were looking to help Kano. And I says, okay, what are you, so you're only charging that? I said, what are you charging for your service? Oh, same as I'm charging for you guys, brother. And I went, no, 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 hang on a minute. I says, you're running a business here that's got to go forward. You can't go forward without a profit margin. I says, brother, what you should be doing, because I've had businesses before and I've run my own clubs and I've employed people before, so I had a wisdom about that sort of thing. I says, brother, what you should be charging is what you're paying us and what you're paying yourself, even if it is the same as what we're getting. But there should be a buffer on top of that, which is the profit margin for the business, so that you can develop the business and move it forward. You can't move it forward without a profit margin. Yes, we all need a wage, and you need a wage, but more importantly, you need to go forward as a business. You need to be charging $25 an hour, which is what I would be charging, allowing you a reasonable profit per hour off of each one of the guys, including yourself. And as the business grows, you're going to need a larger income, because you're going to be a lot busier, you're going to have more expenses. So you've got to look at the business from that point of view. And he looks at me and goes, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. He hadn't thought about that because money didn't mean anything to him. What he was trying to do meant a lot more to him. And he thought if he was undercutting everybody, he would get the work and be able to help his people and make it cheaper for them. But in all fairness, what we could do, nobody else could do. There was no other security team on this earth that could do what we did within the community. We went to Port Lincoln. Christine was part of the team then and running things by then. And that was great because everything ran so much smoother. Because kind of was like me, with a bit wild cards. and out there having a great time doing something with a lot of faith and support but Christine she was the rock that kept everything working and going forward the business improved the financial status of the business improved that security vehicle now all because the profit margin was there to allow it to go forward and we're at Port Lincoln and the police are telling us telling me because I'm speaking to the liaison officers as I did a lot for Carnot and they're saying to me you can have riots tonight last time that it was here, there was riots right through Port Lincoln, the, 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 uh, the riot squad from Adelaide had to come down here and help solve the problem, and I'm going, what are you talking about? 
It's going to be fine. Everything will be fine. At the end of that night, the next morning, I see the same liaison officer. I go, we didn't have any trouble last night at all. He goes, I'll wait till tonight. And I Cabaret said, tonight. Cabaret tonight. It'll be big. There'll be riots. I go, no, they won't. He says, well, your uniforms are on the outside of the fence, and with the security on the inside of the fence, there will not be any problems. We had another night. It was the big night. It was huge. On stairs, on chairs. And we had to stand on tables and chairs and pool tables to see over the crowd. It was that jam-packed. And we had to use a lot of strategies to get them outside to, to, allow, to, to, to allow us to have more room. We were very clever about that sort of thing as a team. But we followed through that whole weekend without an ounce of trouble. And at the end of that weekend, I went to the same lia liaison officer and told him straight, see, the difference between you guys and us is that we know what we're doing and you guys are stupid. And he went, oh, you shouldn't talk to me that way. But it's true. Yeah. If you had riots here without us and you didn't, didn't have a problem the whole time we were here, maybe your education is limited. But our education through Kano was exception, exceptional. And the community trusted us because we were there for them. And they were aware of that. And we could do something nobody else could do. That's right. And we'll put that under the category of magic. Under the category <laughs> of magic. But the thing is, one highlight in the security that I can uh, explain to you about is uh, when the, um, the Olympics, 2000 Olympics, Sydney Olympics, they actually come to us. So-called come to us, and they come and sat and met us all in the other way centre, all the ones that you know wanted to know would we take a team over to do the security at the Olympics. So we were all for that. So then they come back for another meeting, and we're sitting in I don't know in like a little garden, a beer garden or something like that, in a, a pub that's in Gawler Place, and it's a long table like this, and we thinking oh there'll be this security company there that security company there we were the only ones there we were the only ones of south australia that, that the, the guys for the security for the, the olympics wanted so paul donato sat down at the end of the table he wanted carno right next to him and i'm next to carno and carno's even eating his food with his fingers and i'm saying carno he's not before oh no no he's fine he can eat any way he wants so that's how we did it and then it got to the stage where, oh, it's drink time, you know, what do you want? And because Kano and I both ordered a Coke. No, oh, I have a real drink. Kano said, I don't drink alcohol. They could not believe that this was a person, a black fella, that did not drink alcohol. I said, there's a lot of them around. So anyway, we went over there. We were over there for six weeks doing security over in the Olympics. Had an absolute ball, took a team with us. They all gave us medals after, you know, and the company we worked for gave us medals, the police gave us medals. It's, yeah, it was great. I always had that forthright attitude, but the team was special, but he was it led was. by a special man. And yeah. he, his heart was in it, and our hearts were in it because we loved him and we just wanted to help the guy. And that's what it was all about for us. All the guys that worked for Carno really didn't care that much about the money. We were there for him. Well, there was times that we actually did some Oh, we made some Quickly, money. Uh, times we actually uh, did some security that they didn't even pay us enough because right. the door prize, what the door money wasn't enough. So Kano and I did not get paid. We just make sure the boys were paid. He always made sure the boys were paid. There was times where he rang us and said, oh, "It's a volunteer job," and we did it without pay. And it didn't yep. bother us. Okay, so um, George, what made um, Kano so good at martial arts? Okay, that's a really easy question to answer. You either I or you aren't. He was born a warrior. He came from a warrior culture. He had a warrior mentality. And he had to fight for the right to be Australian, just like the rest of us warriors had to be. Most of us, I think, became who we were, not just by our bloodlines and our genetics, but by our environment. Kano needed to be, always be strong, always be forthright, and always be able to fight. My life was the same growing up. I fought for the right every day to be caught in Australia and not a go home wog. So we had it in our, in our essence, in our genetics, but also in our environment. And the, the ability he had to remember things, he had an identity memory. He had an ability to remember everything he was shown. So becoming a great martial artist for him was easy because I always saw him as what we called a genius. Mm. I always used to call him a genius as a martial artist because what he did to what he learned, what he learned from me and what he learned from another, a lot of other guys after me, he put all that together in a, in a manner that I'd never seen before. 
and in a concept that I'd never seen before. And I started martial arts as a 10 year old kid. And I've started Shotokan, Kyokushinkai, Judo, Jiu Jitsu, Zendokai, and I boxed for two years. But even with that experience and running my own style now, with all that experience, I'd never seen someone put martial arts together in a format like that to create Rem and Jerry martial arts was quite genius to the point where some of the things were I couldn't even I understood everything he was doing I knew every technique some of them most of them were the techniques I showed him but the way he put them together I could never have imagined it that way if I hadn't seen it I could never even I could never have imagined putting it together that mm. and nobody ever has yeah. he's the only man that put martial arts together and the techniques together the way he did he had genius about him it was in his brilliance but I think that comes from his cultural warriorhood and his understanding of, yeah. of who he was as a warrior. Yeah, but he had a passion too, an absolute passion for martial arts to the point that oh, he loved it. If you come to visit and had a cup, he wanted, he'd want to be showing you stuff. He taught yeah. everybody that I knew. Every yeah. time he was around, he started teaching. Well, the thing is, you know, we go down to Morocco and he want to teach his, uh, his two nephews. And of course, mummy was saying, don't hurt them. You know, so he'd say, let them grow up to be wusses. Let them go and play the piano. So anyway, um, but constantly, constantly, always trying to better himself and better the style. He'd come to my club, and I'm teaching, he's come to join us for the night, and he takes all my black belts away and starts teaching them. <laughs> so now I'm teaching the students, but I've lost all my black belts because they're over in a corner in a circle, and can I teach them all that? And I'm looking over thinking, well, that's not going to do them any harm. I guess I'll have to work alone tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm off teaching and he's off, he's taking all my black belts. Yeah. There's 10 of them over there in the corner yeah, and I'm that teaching way of doing that. 30 students over here by myself. And I think, yeah, I've lost all my backup. Well, do you remember the time down at Port Adelaide where Kano disappeared? And I, I said to George, where did Kano go? He said, I don't know. I said, he must have gone in the Naval Association and go to the toilet. Next minute you could hear the guitar going. <laughs> <laughs> he's in there playing the guitar for him and singing the song to him. <laughs> and I walk in and I just go, <laughs> it happened at Tandania, we were doing security there. All of a sudden I look around and Carlos on the stage playing the guitar, playing Johnny Be Good. And I go, <laughs> what's going on here? We're yeah. supposed to be working here. Yeah. He's out there playing the guitar. Yeah. Oh God, it's good to be in charge, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was always, oh, you know, put this together, put that together, put that together. Yeah. And it goes into a flow. And then he would say, oh, babe, I've just got something new. Let me your arm for a minute. So I'd be standing there, he's got my arm going this way and that way and that way. Yeah, and yeah every time he did that to me, I'd call one of my black belts out and show it on him so I could see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't want that happening to yeah. my arm. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, it's just the passion that he had. And he was always, always sitting down, wants to learn more, wants to learn more. So he would watch a tape or, he, you know, he whatever. Was, he was the only student I ever had that was my equal. In the end, he was my equal. And I've never had another student that was my equal. Where Kano passed, he passed at George's club. Yeah. And he passed through a grading. And I hope I get through this without crying. And he, um, they, um, when they, when they were doing it, he was just, he must have been, uh, he must have knew something was wrong because he was saying to the one that he was sparring with, he was actually in that team, the senseis in the grading team. Yeah, he was part of the panel. And, um, you know, he was the seventh Dan in George's style. Yeah. And um, so when I got there, I expected him to, uh, to be sitting up with a white blanket, you get in hospital and around him, but he wasn't, he was laying on the floor, which was really hard. And uh, then, He'd, George said that he passed as a warrior on his feet. Uh, Squizzy and uh, Ma, uh, um, Squizzy, Adam, Adam were trying to revive Corey, him. And Corey, who just got out of the army, was yeah, highly qualified. They were trying to revive him until the paramedics got there. And uh, one of the other young students had come over to Kangaroo Island for, uh, I think, and nine Corey. days or something like that. Corey and Ashley. Oh, Ashley yeah. Ashley said, uh, he said, they're coming to get me. And there was a, a golf ball up in the, the rafters that had been there for years. And it just That's dropped. Right. It just dropped. And then Kano dropped. I was sparring at the time, but I sensed something. I was not more than a metre away from Kano. And I looked at him and it's like I sensed something because I'm sparring with one of the guys. And I just stopped and looked at him and he just fell forward. Now, Kano was a seventh degree black belt. One of the greatest warriors I'd ever known. 
And there's no way, if he had any consciousness left, would he have fallen flat on his face. He would have turned, he would have rolled, he would have broken his fall. It's in our instinct. I've come up on motorcycles at high speed and not hurt myself because I've instinctively gone into a roll and got back on my feet. Yeah. Kano would not have just fallen flat on his face ever. My opinion, and in that moment, I believe Kano died standing on his feet the way he lived. And after he died, his body hit the floor. Okay, George. Um what did other martial arts masters think about uh, Kano? Well, I took my shirt off to show you this, which is Kano, and underneath it is Tank Yu Shin, which, was my, which is my style, which is what I graded Kano in. And over here I carry Charlie, and underneath I've written Bushido. And he was the greatest Bushido warrior that ever lived. I believe Bushido was his way, and he was an incre incredible master, and he loved Kano. Charlie was one of my best friends, he was my best friend for 43 years and he fell in love with Kano just like I did. The fortunate thing was I had Kano in my club, Charlie had a club not far away but we were all mates and Charlie loved Kano and understood Kano the same way I did, understood his genius, understood his brilliance. Um, now, Kano, now Kano passed away at our grading. Charlie had stage 4 cancer at that, st at that point and had only, only lived two weeks longer. But he came to Kano's funeral and skin and bone, got him, pulled himself out of bed, sick as he was, and carried him, and got his son to carry him into the funeral and to take him over to Christine. I took him over to Christine and then I took him to Kano so that he could pray over Kano and say goodbyes. But this is a man that was the strongest warrior I'd ever known. And by this point in his life, he was, a skeleton in skin. Yet he had the courage, the tenacity, and the love for Kano and Christine to come to his funeral, and then two weeks later, he was gone. Now, he told Christine that day, I'll be seeing Kano before you, and two weeks later, he was gone. And there was no saving with Charlie, and it took his son to carry him in, and for me to help him and carry him through the aisle to Christine and help him back to his son, and at the end of that, Charlie just said, I can't stay, George, I can't manage, I have to go. He shouldn't have even been there. But there's a man that honoured and loved Kano so much that before he died, he made sure he was there for Kano and for Christine. And he was one of the greatest warriors in this town. And he was highly respected right across the country. But he knew who Kano was. He knew Kano's brilliance. And he knew Kano's heart. You don't do that for a man and for his woman unless you truly know the man's heart. And Charlie knew Kano's heart like I did. I used to call him Three Musketeers. Charlie's name's Charlie Bamboris. And, and so I said that because we were referring to Charlie, Charlie, Charlie through the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, Charlie so, Camboris. Charlie Camboris. Camboris. Charlie Camboris. George Macias yeah. and Kano Walker are the Three Musketeers. We were pretty special when we were together. But we did that football carnival and I got Charlie in on the team there for that one. And boy was I'm glad we had him there because there was a lot of people and he was the right man to have around because he had that ability to draw people in. He had that personality. Are that you talking are you talking about him? He's the only one exercising, running around the oval, running around the oval. We're working twelve hours. And then he sat and then he's between, going for a for a run. And then he sat between two stools and his, his legs were Yeah, he split them did the old Van Damme split between the two stools. Oh God, he was but amazing. We're working 12 hours and he's getting up and going for a run. I'm going, what are you doing, Charlie? I said, we just, we just worked 12 hours. I'm exhausted, you go for a run. He goes, yeah, got to keep my conditioning up. He had the greatest conditioning I'd ever seen on in a man. And the most beautiful teeth I've ever seen on a man too. <laughs> the women loved him as well. Yeah. But Kana had the same thing going for him. The women loved him too. Mm -hmm. They had this charisma about them that was special. You know? But that could be trusted, and that was the difference. Yeah. You know, there were men that could be trusted around women. Yeah. Especially Kano, he had a great honour. He had a great dignity. Okay, do you guys have any more stories about um, Kano and his martial arts and security work? Plenty. Yeah, we've got heaps of stories, <laughs> and we've got some funny ones. Uh, one that comes to mind right now is we were doing security at the Folk Festival out of Victor Harbour. And 
We had an indigenous, indigenous fellow that was just running a mark and we had to have him detained. We detained him, brought the police in. We needed him off the premises, so they arrested him. They had him in handcuffs. And Kano was standing on my right, and this fellow was standing on Kano's right with the two police officers facing us. And this whole time, this guy's abusing Kano, calling him such a lot of horrible names, accusing him of turning on his people, and he was being extremely insulted. Now, Kano's a dignified man and doesn't tolerate insults, but we got two policemen standing in front of us. So Kano points in that direction and goes, what's that? The two police officers turn their heads to look. I oh, know Kano better than that. I did not turn my head. I watched Kano. And while he was still pointing in that direction, he slaps a short back fist on this guy's chin, snaps him one, and the guy just falls back and lays down on the grass. He's out like a light. The police turn around and said, what happened? And Kano goes, he fell down. And I, the cops looked at me and I went, yeah, yep, yep, that's exactly what happened. I saw it myself. He fell down, all right, <laughs> out like a light, no movement at all. And it was a hilarious story because Kano didn't want to do it. He just wanted to shut this guy up because it was an insult. And the policemen, I think, figured it out, but couldn't care less. They didn't see a thing. It was just brilliant. It's the way he operated. It's the way he always was, eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah.